Now, the buildings of the Villa Ludovisi and its associated gardens and the many art treasures of the Ludovisi collection, well, they attracted the admiration of many visitors after John Evelyn, uh, including Goethe, who visited in 1787, Stendhal, who visited in 1828, Nikolai Gogol, who visited in the late uh, 1830s or early 1840s, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, who gives us an invaluable description from the year 1858, and also Henry James, uh, who visited in 1873 at a crucial moment in its history. Well, these are just to name a few of the literary luminaries. I'd love to treat them all, but basically in the interest of time, we're just going to turn to the latter two, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry James. Let's first turn to Nathaniel Hawthorne. In January of 1858, after four years of service as the U.S. Consul in Liverpool, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne came to Rome with his wife and three children. He was aged about 54 at that point. As it turns out, he was to spend almost a year and a half in Italy, right into May of 1859, with visits to Siena and Florence, but Rome was his base. Well, in his journals, he recorded from what was essentially a tourist's vantage point, many exquisitely detailed impressions of the country and its cultural riches, and his, the chief literary expression of this Italian experience was Hawthorne's 1860 work, The Marble Fawn. It was the last of his four great romances, which he, he mostly wrote after leaving the continent for England. Well, his journals include uh, Hawthorne's account of a family visit to the Villa Ludovisi on the 26th of March, 1858, and this is some two months after their arrival in Rome. And one can see early glimpses of a melancholic view of the Eternal City that, that soon became much more pronounced after his eldest daughter, Una, who was then aged about 18, suffered a serious attack of the notorious strain of malaria known as Roman fever. And his daughter almost died. And this experience obviously colored Hawthorne's perception of the city. He later would say, I bitterly detest Rome. And the, a, a, about a year uh, after his visit to the Villa Ludovisi, in fact, not quite a year, uh, in February of 1859, he wrote to a friend, um, uh, the publisher James Thomas Fields. He says, I shall rejoice to bid it farewell forever, that is, Rome itself, and I fully acquiesce in all the mischief and ruin that has happened to it from Nero's conflagration downward, so in other words, from the year A.D. 64. In fact, I wish the very sight had been obliterated before I saw it. Well, harsh words. But let's roll back the clock just a little, when Hawthorne was still in a mostly positive mood and visiting the Villa Ludovisi. Well, Hawthorne tells us a bit about the mechanics of his visit, which is very, very interesting if one is going to discuss the Grand Tour. How do you actually get into these private collections? Well, in his case, it was a ticket. And then this ticket, he says, came directly from the Prince of Piombini. Now, we know who that was. It was Antonio Boncompagni Ludovisi. Um, he had been Prince of Piombino um, after the death of his father, Luigi. Uh, Luigi Boncompagni Ludovisi, we've seen in action at the Congress of Vienna. Well, in uh, 1841, uh, Antonio Boncompagni Ludovisi became the head of family and had a very colorful life, which included exile from Rome uh, personally at the um, command of Pope Pius IX, as we shall see. Well, Hawthorne's experience was typical in this regard. A written application directly to the Prince Boncompagni Ludovisi, the head of family, was the standard mode of applying for a visit to the Villa Ludovisi for the whole latter half of the 19th century. Now, here's, a, for me, an interesting observation that the children of Nathaniel Hawthorne and his wife Sophia Hawthorne at the time of the visit were aged 18, that was Una, and there was an 11-year-old named Julian, and one who was not quite seven, his daughter Rose. So even pretty young children could, admit, could gain admission to the villa and its museum. By this time, I should say that there was actually a formal museum, private museum, on the premises. Well, on the day of their appointment, which happens to have been a Friday, um, for what it is worth, 
Hawthorne and his family entered through the main gate, the Ingresso and the Via Friuli, uh, and with its characteristic bend, which one can still see today, even though it is now uh, totally subsumed uh, into the compound of the American Embassy in Rome, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, or a while, rather. And they managed to see the Casino della Statua. The, um, the, this is a separate establishment, which at this point housed the most famous sculptural works of the Museo Ludovisi. And then apparently they wandered quite freely around the extensive grounds of the villa. And finally, the family, along with a small group of other visitors, entered the Casino Aurora, perhaps by special pleading, for it was then under repair. And in fact, we know a major expansion of the Casino Aurora was just then in its final stages. Well, at the Casino Aurora, Hawthorne managed to see Guercino's Aurora fresco, but apparently not the Fama on the floor above it. He also climbed the famed spiral staircase that practically all visitors know, and he ascended to the casino's um, upper story terrace with its spectacular view of the city and beyond, the Toretta. Significantly, Hawthorne says nothing of the Palazzo Grande, uh, which will have been the main residence of the Boncompagni Ludovisi family at this time, or rather, it, it was the main um, uh, residence of the um, Boncompagni Ludovisi in the villa context. Um, the story of where they lived is a very, very complicated one indeed, one we can just simply nod toward, which we will in a subsequent lecture. But evidently, the Palazzo Grande was not accessible to visitors in this era. Hence the formation of this purpose-built museum, the Casino della Statua. Well, Hawthorne didn't intend for these journal entries from his uh, family's Italian sojourn, none of it, to be published. And his wife, Sophia Hawthorne, Sophia Peabody Hawthorne, uh, transcribed um, after his death what was soon issued as um, Passages from the French and Italian Notebooks of Nathaniel Hawthorne, published in 1871, in fact, after uh, Sophia's death in February of that year. Now, it's interesting to take a look at the Boncompagni Ludovisi family at the time the Hawthorne family was visiting. Antonio um, uh, Boncompagni Ludovisi and his wife, uh, uh, Guglielmina Massimo, well, they had five surviving children. And they ranged from the eldest, uh, uh, who was then age 26, Rodolfo, born in 1832. He would soon become, well, not soon, he would later become head of the family and uh, played a very consequential role in the um, story of the family and its villa Ludovisi. And the youngest at this point was just aged four, Lavinia, uh, who was born in 1854. Interestingly, a son, Livio, had died just the previous summer, in August of 1857, a month uh, before his um, uh, 16th birthday, and there was a daughter called Philomena, uh, who had died in infancy, um, back in 1836. Well, their second eldest son was Ignazio Boncompagni Ludovisi, the second eldest son of Rodolfo. And it was he who was responsible for that photographic campaign that resulted uh, in the images of the Villa Ludovisi that we're using uh, not just throughout this lecture, but throughout this course. But let's go back to Nathaniel Hawthorne, because we are talking about the Grand Tour. Here's his entry, uh, m most of it, from the 26th of March, 1858. And the details are, to me, are interesting. What day of the week, which was a Friday, and also what time they uh, visited. Well, as he said, yesterday, between 12 and 1, our whole family went to the Villa Ludovisi, so children were allowed. The entrance to which is at the termination of a street which passes out of the Piazza Barberini, and it is no very great distance from our own street, via Porta Pinciana. And as I've said, um, that uh, the bend of the Via, via Friuli, in fact, all the Via Friuli is inside the U.S. Embassy compound. To return to Hawthorne. The grounds, though very extensive, are wholly within the walls of the city which skirt them, and they comprise a part of what was formerly the Gardens of Sallust. Correct. Uh, this was a, um, 
uh, the Ludovico Ludovici chose as his site one that had a venerable history, um, not just uh, Sallust, the uh, late Roman Republican historian, and later passing to Caesar, but in fact actually to the Roman imperial family for um, uh, some centuries. The villa is now the property of Prince Piombini, a ticket from which procured us admission. A little within the gateway to the right is a casino containing two l large rooms filled with sculpture, much of which is very valuable. The technical name for this building is the Casino Caponi, uh, and here's what it looked like as it appeared in 1885. Today the site is occupied by an auto maintenance garage for the U.S. Embassy. Hawthorne continues. A colossal head of Juno, I believe, is considered the greatest treasure of the collection. But I did not myself feel it to be so, nor indeed did I receive any strong impression of its excellence. Well, this was really one of the most famous works of art, not just of the Bon Compagnie Ludovici, but of the um, art collecting world. Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici himself acquired it, um, and this Juno Ludovici is now in the um, Museo Nazionale Romano at the Palazzo Altep, the Roman National Museum. And Goethe, for one, admired this colossal head so much that he made his own cast. Hawthorne continues, I admired nothing so much, I think, as the face of Penelope, if it be her face, in the group supposed also to represent Electra and Orestes. Well, there's a little confusion here. It was Johann Joachim Winkelmann um, who in the 18th century, who first identified these figures as uh, Electra, recognizing her brother Orestes. But Hawthorne seems to opt for a tradition that they represent Penelope and her son Telemachus. And these are already listed in the, this uh, group is already listed in the Villa Ludovici inventory of 1623. And today the sculptural group is in the Palazzo Altemps. Hawthorne then uh, makes note of the Ares Ludovici, also now in the, now in the Palazzo Altemps. Um, uh, Hawthorne calls it very fine. Uh, Winkelmann, for his part, however, in the 18th century, called the sculpture the most beautiful Mars from antiquity. And um, his shield, his hands, his feet, and the, in fact the head, arms, and feet of that small Eros at his uh, uh, right leg, the Cupid, well, they saw restorations by Bernini in 1622. Well, Hawthorne, after declaring that the seated uh, Mars was fine, he says, so is the Aria and Pytus, and so are many other busts and figures. Well, this sculpture, which Hawthorne calls the Aria and Pytus, uh, and, um, which is today housed in the Palazzo Altemps, um, is now known as the Suicidal Gaul and his wife. And this first appears in the Villa Ludovici inventories from 1623. It's likely that Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici discovered it in, in developing the Roman-era Gardens of Sallust for his newly purchased villa. Well, this statue group of the suicidal Gaul and his wife, and also the um, so-called um, uh, dying Gaul, uh, these are examples, uh, surely, of the Pergamene school of uh, sculpture that flourished in the 3rd and 2nd century BC and was located in Western Asia Minor in Anatolia at the site of Pergamum, um, with patronage by the Adelid um, uh, kings that reigned that kingdom down to 133 BC. Well, Hawthorne continues, by and by we left the casino and uh, wandered among the grounds, th threading interminable alleys of cypress through the long vistas of which we could see here and there a statue, an urn, a pillar, a temple, a garden house, or bas relief against the wall. Well, the greatest of those reliefs, I should say, is the colossal head of Alexander the Great, which is embedded right into the Aurelian walls. I mean, the sculpture is still visible today on the Via Campania, which is just east of its intersection with the Via Veneto, uh, though the modern street is several meters lower than the path um, that you can see in this image because of the um, development of this area in the late uh, 19th century. Hawthorne continues with a general reflection. It seems as if there must have been a time, and not so very long ago, when it was worthwhile 
to spend money and thought upon the ornamentation of grounds in the neighborhood of Rome. That time is past, however, and the result is very melancholy, for great beauty has been produced, but it can be enjoyed in its perfection only at the peril of one's life. For my part, and judging from my own experience, I suspect that the Roman atmosphere, never wholesome, is always more or less poisonous. He's speaking here of the Roman fever and the uh, uh, ever-present danger of malaria. But Hawthorne still has more to say. We came to another and larger casino remote from the gateway, in which the prince resides during two months of the year. This is a very valuable fact that we, we're given. Uh, and the casino in question is the um, Casino Aurora. It was now under repair, but we gained admission, as did several other visitors, and saw in the entrance hall the Aurora of Guercino, painted in fresco on the ceiling. And here's a detail from Guercino's great ceiling fresco and the piano terra of the Casino Aurora. It's, it's a executed um, for Ludovico Ludovici, the nephew of Pope Gregory the Fifteenth, and it's clearly programmatic about the new dawn that has come to Rome with the Bolognese Pope Gregory the Fifteenth and the, the Ludovici. Uh, the dawn is expressly robed in the Ludovici colors of red and gold, and one can go even further that she's banishing night, uh, which is the representation. Uh, it's been uh, held, and I think very convincingly, um, that uh, uh, of the, the representation of the papacy of Pope Paul V of Borghese. But the judgments um, in the past of the uh, Aurora have been it was judged more harshly than it has been in our own day. Says Hawthorne, there's beauty in the design, but the painter certainly was most unhappy in his black shadows. And in the work before us, they give the impression of a cloudy and lowering morning, which is likely enough to turn to rain by and by. Well, after viewing the uh, fresco, says Hawthorne, we mounted by a spiral staircase to a lofty terrace. This is the staircase of Moderno and the Toretta of the Casino Aurora that everyone mentions. And we found Rome at our feet, and far off the Sabine and Alban mountains, some of them still capped with snow. In another direction there was a vast plain on the horizon of which, could our eyes have reached to its verge, we might perhaps have seen the Mediterranean Sea. It seems that already there was a standard itinerary within the Casino Aurora, that one would see the um, um, uh, Aurora room itself, and then ascend up the stairs for the magnificent view from the Toretta, and that seems to have been pretty much it. However, um, the um, tower of the uh, Casino Aurora was considered the second highest point in Rome. Only the Aqua Paula and the Geniclo was, uh, was higher, so this was a real treat for all, I mean, then and now. And Hawthorne uh, continues. After enjoying the view and the warm sunshine, we descended and went in quest of the gardens of Sallust, but found no satisfactory remains of them. And he continues, One of the most striking objects in the first casino, that is the Casino della Statua, was a group by Bernini. Pluto, an outrageously masculine and strenuous figure, heavily bearded, ravishing away a little tender Proserpine. Uh, whom he holds aloft while his forcible grip impresses itself into her soft virgin flesh. It is very disagreeable, but it makes one feel that Bernini was a man of great ability. And as we've seen that this is um, the statue was a um, Ludovici, then Bon Compagni Ludovici got possession from 1622 until 1908 and is now in the Galleria Borghese. And here is Hawthorne's concluding thought on the sculpture of uh, Bernini in his last words on the villa. There are some works in literature that bear an analogy to his, that is Bernini's, works in sculpture. When great power is lavished a little outside of nature, and therefore proves to be only a fashion and not permanently adapted to the tastes of mankind. <laughs>